Hello, welcome back. I'm Jason, and today we're venturing into the final frontier of space to answer the following question. What actually happens to our bodies when we fly into space? From the weird to the wondrous, we're breaking down the science of space travel and how it impacts our earthly bodies. Now, as someone who personally would love to go into space and worked at NASA for quite a long time, if it ever becomes commonplace to do so, I have a vested interest in knowing exactly what happens to our bodies when we go into space. Now, before we get to the actual long-term effects of space on the human body, what is it actually like to ride on a rocket as you enter orbit? What does it actually feel like? I've been lucky enough to talk to many astronauts about this, so I'd like to chat with you about it now. Now, first off, let's talk about launch itself. Picture this, just think about it. You're strapped into your seat, you're looking up at the sky, and you feel a rumble beneath you. The engines ignite, and the force of liftoff hits you and pushes you into your chair, but it doesn't let up, it doesn't ease up. On the space shuttle, for instance, the first stage, they said, felt like a freight train. The two giant solid rocket boosters, very, very, very shaky. When those separated, it got very, very smooth, and they said, many astronauts said, that it felt like it was floating on a cloud in comparison when they went to the second stage. I'd like you to hear what the astronauts said in their own words. So here's what astronaut Chris Hadfield described it as. He said, it feels like being inside of a drum during a heavy metal concert. The vibration and the noise are intense. Your whole body is actually shaking and the G-forces push you violently, and the word violently is important here, into your seat. Another astronaut, Mike Massimino, shared his experience. You feel like there's an elephant sitting on your chest. That's what he said. Breathing becomes more labored and you have to really focus on staying calm and following the procedures. Now, as liftoff happens and the rocket ascends and the stages separate, the forces ease up, but the ride remains bumpy. The final stage cuts off and suddenly, out of nowhere, you're in orbit. This is where many astronauts report a surreal and almost magical transition. Basically, many astronauts that I've personally talked to say that it basically feels like you come over a hill in a car and you feel those butterflies, right? Well, when you enter space, you feel those butterflies, but they never really stop for a really long time before you get acclimated to it. So it's like you're coming over a hill, but the hill never quite ends. Eventually it does go away, but it lasts for quite a long time. But what about the physical effects of space travel? The transition to weightlessness can be a mixed bag. Some astronauts describe it as exhilarating, while others find it very disorienting and dizzying, and yes, actually nauseating. Um, space adaptation syndrome, or SMS, space motion sickness, is a common occurrence. Astronaut Story Musgrave, someone who flew in space many, many times, said the following. You go from heavy G-forces to the sudden sensation of floating. It's disorienting at first. Some people adapt quickly, while others take a few days to actually adapt. So how common is it for astronauts to actually feel sick when they enter orbit? According to NASA, about half of all astronauts experience some degree of space motion sickness. Symptoms can include dizziness, headaches, nausea, you know, the whole thing, all three at once. Unfortunately, yes, vomiting is part of the experience for some people. And I will say, when I worked in mission control, the first several hours, probably even the first six to eight hours, as soon as we reach orbit, there's a very light schedule. There are procedures that need to be done, but we intentionally give extra time, and uh, actually there's a code word that depends on the mission that usually they radio down when someone's sick. So if things aren't getting done, we're actually expected and told to expect that things are gonna take longer because they're probably in the bathroom with a barf bag. Astronaut Scott Kelly, who spent about a year aboard the International Space Station, shared his experience. The first couple of days can be rough. You feel queasy. Your body is trying to figure out which way is up. But after that, most people adapt and feel totally fine. Now, despite the initial discomfort, most astronauts emphasize the feeling of floating and the view of Earth from space make it all worthwhile. Astronaut Peggy Whitson holds the record for the most cumulative days in space spent by any NASA astronaut at 675 days, and this is how she described the experience. It's like 
Nothing you've ever experienced, she said. The feeling of floating is absolutely incredible, and the view is simply breathtaking. It's a privilege to be able to see our planet from this perspective. In fact, a lot of astronauts I've talked to personally, uh, including those that have done uh, EVAs in the spacewalks, right? They say it's actually quite lonely to look at the Earth from space. You get a feeling of loneliness because when you see the whole planet and then just blackness uh, surrounding on all sides, we, we often think of Earth as this gigantic place with lots of places, but when you see it from space, it looks quite lonely and quite isolated in the blackness of space. So let's move from short duration missions to longer missions. What happens to your body on the longer missions? Moon missions will be multiple weeks or maybe months at a time for a moon base, and a mission to Mars will be months or even years long. The lack of gravity in space leads to bigger changes in the body. Let's start with muscles and bones. So here on Earth, our muscles are constantly working against gravity all the time, even when you're just standing. This resistance keeps them strong and healthy, but in space, without that gravitational pull and that extra work all the time, the muscles begin to weaken and atrophy, and the bones begin to lose density. This is known as spaceflight osteopenia. Now, studies from the Skylab missions, which is a space station we had in the 70s, showed that astronauts can lose up to 1-2% to of their bone mass per month in space. That's because bones, which are constantly being broken down and rebuilt, need the stress of gravity to stay strong. And without that constant stress, they begin to weaken, making astronauts more prone to fractures and other injuries. It'd be bad news to show up on Mars and then not be able to walk around or break a bone really easily because everything was weakened in your body. Now, speaking of muscles, the ones that are most affected are the postural muscles, those in your back and legs that help you stand and move around. Without regular use, they actually start to shrink. They physically get smaller. Additionally, astronauts can experience a condition known as fluid shift. With no gravity to pull fluids down, meaning blood, in your body, they move up toward the head, and this can cause facial puffiness and nasal congestion all the time and even increased pressure inside the skull, potentially leading to vision problems. Now, most astronauts are a few centimeters taller in space as the spine is no longer under compression from gravity. But after they return to Earth, their normal height returns. One particularly strange phenomenon reported by astronauts is the experience of seeing bright flashes of light when their eyes are closed. This occurs because cosmic rays from outer space, high energy particles from space that penetrate the spacecraft walls, pass right through the eyes. And these particles can stimulate the retina, creating the sensation of light flashes, even in total darkness. Now, I was lucky enough to work with several astronauts. One of them, his name was Franklin Chang Diaz. I worked with him for several years, actually. He told me that whenever he would close his eyes to go to sleep, you know, and get some rest, uh, he would periodically see these bright flashes of light just randomly. And it made it really hard to go to sleep because you have your eyes closed and you see like a camera flash going off. And that's because these particles coming in, hitting your retina and triggering that sensation in your eyes so you can't get away from it. You can't hide from it. Nothing, a pillow, nothing's going to stop it. Now, it wasn't like a constant thing. It would only happen during certain parts of the orbit when this random sort of event would happen. But it's pretty disorienting and pretty weird. Now, let's talk for a second about the cardiovascular system. On Earth, gravity helps to pull blood towards your lower extremities in your body. But in space, without any gravity and zero gravity, blood and other fluids redistribute throughout your body. So this, as I mentioned a minute ago, leads to noticeable swelling in the face and a reduction in blood volume. Now, over time, the heart doesn't have to work as hard to pump the blood around your body because there's no gravity. So this leads to a reduction in heart muscle mass. And this can pose challenges when astronauts return to Earth and suddenly have to readjust to gravity. Now, I want you to let that sink in. The heart, after you're in space for a really long period of time, is not as strong as your heart was when you took off. That's kind of a big deal. We, we obviously need a heart to live, right? It doesn't mean you're going to have a heart attack. People come home to Earth, but you'll often see after a year or two in space, they come home to Earth and they have to be carried off the spaceship. They can't walk, and their heart just can't pump as much blood volume because it's not as strong as it was. And so they get a little lightheaded, right? So we have to understand that. Maybe develop drugs, exercise. Exercise is really important as well for all of this stuff in order to deal with it as we venture into deep space. So with all of these challenges, how do we prepare astronauts 
for long duration missions, such as a trip to Mars. Researchers are developing various countermeasures and medicines to mitigate the negative effects of prolonged weightlessness. So these include rigorous exercise. That's probably the number one thing. Using resistance bands, because you don't have gravity, so you have to have resistance bands. And specialized equipment to simulate the effect of gravity on muscles and bones. Astronauts also wear what we call compression garments to help prevent the fluid shift and maintain proper circulation. And let me just say that this exercise regime that we have in orbit for astronauts on the space station is pretty intense. They exercise about two hours every single day. That's seven days a week, every day, just to stay in shape. What do they do up there? They have a treadmill. You might say, how do they run on a treadmill? Well, they have straps that come over the shoulder that are like bungees that keep you bouncing down into the, into the treadmill so you can keep running. There's a resistance bicycle. There's, there's an arm bike. You'll see them doing this, again, with resistance, with some kind of resistance uh, a flywheel or pulley kind of system. Bicep curls, lots of straps, lots of countermeasures with elastic bands and things like that. Now, more long-term, another area of focus is artificial gravity. Concepts for rotating spacecraft or sections of the spacecraft that can create centripetal force or centrifugal force are being explored. Now, this can help simulate gravity and keep astronauts' bodies in better shape during long-duration journeys. Let me say that probably when I worked at NASA, the number one question that my friends and family would ask me is, where is the anti-gravity chamber at NASA? Where's the gravity generator? We don't have such technology. There is no anti-gravity chamber. If you see an astronaut floating, they're either in a spacecraft in space or they're in an airplane that's doing these dives, these parabolic climbs and dives, and it, it gives you a little bit of weightlessness. We do not have a technology like Star Trek on a ship to create gravity or any technology to remove gravity. The only thing we know how to do is to rotate or spin the spacecraft. You've probably seen artwork for these very large donut space stations that rotate. That could generate something that would be approximate to gravity. The only issue, and it's a big issue, is that you can't have a small spacecraft. If you have something the size of a house rotating, then yes, you'll be pushed into it, but you get sideways forces, and so if you, you get dizzy very fast, like a carousel, right? Or uh, uh, some kind of spinning thing at a circus, right? You've had that experience. So the only way to really do it in space is to make a very large object, maybe a kilometer wide or even bigger, so that the, the radius of the object is much, much, much larger than the, than the distance from your head to your toes, because the problem is the forces that you feel at your head, they need to be about the same as, as what you feel at your toes throughout your body, otherwise you get very dizzy. So they have to be very large. Obviously, we don't have the technology for kilometer-long donut space stations yet. But another alternative that's also been tested is instead of a donut space station, you can have a living quarters uh, connected to an engine compartment, let's say, or some other living quarters connected by a very thin tether. And that two-body system can rotate. Maybe it, it flies as a single ship, and then during the cruise stage, maybe it separates with a tether, and then it begins to rotate, and then it comes back together to do the landing phase, something like that. Now, the only issue with that, well, I shouldn't say the only issue, is that these tethers uh, much as the structure of the donut ship is under constant stress. Those tethers, if they snap, then you're going to be flying in two different directions. That's obviously really dangerous, right? Also, if you're in the vicinity of a magnetic field, like if, if, you're, in, if you're doing this anywhere around Earth, Earth has a magnetic field. Any kind, anytime you have a rotating tether like this, then you're going to get induced voltages. That's how we generate electricity on Earth. We have um, conducting materials rotating inside of a magnetic field. And you might say, well, I'll just make the tether out of plastic or something. It's easier said than done. We don't really know how to make things that strong that aren't conductive. We've done small scale experiments, but nothing on the order that would be required for a gigantic spaceship like that. Now, I'm not saying it's not possible. I'm just saying that we need to go up there and build stuff to figure out how to do it. But that's the way to really mitigate the long-term effects of lack of gravity on the human body. Now, nutrition also plays a crucial role in all of this. Diets that are rich in calcium and vitamin D, along with medications to reduce bone density loss, are part of the strategy. And ensuring that the astronauts get the right nutrients to maintain bone and muscle health is essential for their well-being. So to wrap it all up, space travel presents significant challenges to the human body, from muscle atrophy and bone density loss to cardiovascular changes and strange light flashes. But with ongoing research and innovative solutions, we're finding ways to mitigate these effects and to prepare for the next great leap into the cosmos. I'm Jason. Thanks for hanging out with me today on this deep dive into the effect of space 
on the human body. Until next time, keep your eyes on the stars and your feet firmly planted on the ground. Earth makes us all very, very strong. This is Jason. Take care and remember to always stay curious. Learn anything at mathandscience.com.